Amen. Uh, we've been considering the, the events at Gilgal. We have tried to put a little title on each chapter and each passage that we've been reading. And in chapter 5, you really do have the events at Gilgal. We've really considered two of them, and that was the reintroduction of the rite of circumcision. We looked at it symbolically and spiritually, what it meant. It was not only the cutting away of the flesh physically, uh, but symbolically and spiritually, it represented the cutting away of the old life. It represented the separation of the believer from the world and the world around them and from the ungodly nations. It marked out Israel as a people separated unto the Lord. And then we also looked at the reinstating of the Passover. For 40 years in the wilderness, the Passover wasn't celebrated. I said to you, they ate manna. Uh, they never roasted the lamb. They never fed on meat in the wilderness except for the quails when they were sent. And they were sent as a chastisement uh, to the people of God as, a, as opposed to feeding them for the manna was sufficient. They didn't need the quails. They just lusted after flesh as they did for Egypt. And the reinstating of the Passover, these events were important before they could engage the enemy. For the simple reason was this, because they had to be separated unto God. They had to be marked out by the Lord. And then they had also to remember what the Lord had done for them in order that they might love the Lord and follow the Lord and never forget in the rite of the Passover and what the Lord had done for them, that they would be the Lord's, that we would remember uh, that they were to love the Lord their God. They were not to worship idols. They were not to intermingle with the other nations, these ungodly nations. I told you the reason for the Lord putting these nations out of the land, because the cup of the Amorites was full. And they had reached their zenith in their iniquity and rebellion against God. And as a result of that, God sent Israel as an instrument of judgment upon these nations. And the land vomited them out of the land. And God gave the land to Israel. And it now belongs to them to this very day. Uh, there is a third event. I said to you that these three events go together. They encourage the believer before they engage the enemy. And the third event is this, an encounter with Christ, the captain of the Lord's hosts. Those verses 13 through 15, there is an encounter with Christ, the captain of the Lord's hosts. Now, if you notice in verse 13, it, it does seem to suggest to me, at least, that Joshua was alone. For it tells us there in verse 13, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. And we know that any leader... No matter where they go, if it's the Prime Minister of Great Britain or if it's the President of the United States or it's some royal uh, person in the royal family, they have an escort. They have their bodyguards. Uh, quite often when I watch on television, uh, I, I look not just at the, the individual, the President or the Prime Minister. I look at the people that are surrounding. I try to pick out individuals who are bodyguards or who are security personnel, and you can see them. They're, they're very rarely looking at the person. They're always looking at the crowd. They're seeking to protect in case someone jumps over the barrier, in case someone goes to throw something, or in case someone tries to kill that important person. And you can see that they're completely surrounded with security personnel, bodyguards as they're called. But it seems that Joshua, the leader of the entire nation of Israel, was not afraid to be on his own. Such was the confidence Joshua and the Israelites had after crossing over Jordan, after the Lord now delivering them from Egyptian bondage. Such was the encouragement of their faith that they did not fear the enemy. And here Joshua, he was by Jericho. That is, he, he came outside the camp at Gilgal. And, and I believe that there were plains, and he, he moved away into the plains. And he was within sight of Jericho. And we can't say for sure the reason why he went out there, but we do believe, and I, I do believe it's true, that he went out to meditate. He went out, I believe, to talk to the Lord. I believe he went out to look at Jericho and to see those double walls, because there was a double wall, and to think, how will we ever overcome this city? What will we do? How will we scale those walls? Will we have to make ladders? How will we get over? Will we have to have ropes with hooks on them? And what about those huge gates, thick and a double wall? We'll never smash them down. Even if we had catapults with boulders, we would never smash them down. 
We could never hack at them with iron because they could pour hot liquid over us and fire arrows down upon us. And how are we going to get through those huge gates in that city? And the city's vast. At what point will we attack? No doubt Joshua, being the leader, the commander, he was out in the plain and he was looking at Jericho and he was wondering, how will I? How will I overcome this city? How will we defeat these people? God has told us to take the city. How are we going to do it? We've got to have a battle plan. We can't just march to the city and then say, right, what do we do? And Joshua said, I'm not too sure. Maybe we'll take battering rams and we'll take huge trees and we'll, we'll shape them and we'll, we'll have uh, men, maybe about two or three hundred men with battering rams trying to batter down those uh, wooden gates. Maybe Joshua was out, but there's no doubt he was asking the Lord, what should he do? That's why the Lord came by. I'm convinced that the Lord told him, although it's not stated here, it's not stated here. How did he know what to do? How did he know uh, to walk around the city every day for seven days? How did he know that on the last day he would walk around the city seven times? How did he know that the priests were to walk around and they were to be silent and then they would blow with a ram's horns. How did he know all that? I believe that here was the pivotal point. It was here the Lord revealed the plan and how he and the Israelites were to take Jericho. The battle was not yours, Joshua. The battle was mine. I don't want you to look at your army. I want you to look at the army that's with me. And I'm the captain of the hosts of the Lord. So I am convinced in these verses that that's exactly the meaning of them. It suggests to me that he was alone and he was in deep thought, and no doubt he was praying. And I believe both come together. I've heard a commentary say that he was alone meditating, uh, looking at the plan for Jericho. Another said that he was probably praying. I want to tell you he was doing both. And then the Lord met him, and then the Lord answered his prayer. But either way, he had an encounter with a man who stood with his sword drawn, in his hand, and as if he was going to fight with Joshua. This man appeared out of nowhere. Joshua, I believe, was praying with his head down because the Bible says that he lifted up his head and he looked and he saw a man. So he lifted his head. His head was down. He was meditating. He was praying to the Lord. And then when he lifted his, his head, there was a man in front of him. It was a very dangerous time. That's why Joshua shouted, Shout it to the man. Art thou for us? Or are you one of our adversaries? Are you against us? Who are you? He didn't know whether he had come from the city of Jericho or whether he was from one of the other uh, towns or cities or nations. He didn't know who he was. But what he did know was this. He was a man of war. He was a warrior. And he had come to face the leader of Israel, Joshua. And he stood and his sword wasn't sheathed. He came with intention. And that sword was in his hand. It was lifted. It was yielded as though he was saying, Joshua, I'm fighting with you. I'm taking you on. And there's no doubt Joshua was a very courageous man. I come from a long line of cards, believe me. I think my grandparents were the first <laughs> to land on the beaches in Normandy. The first time there was a shot fired. They were first they're back on the shores of Great Britain, let me tell you. Come from a long line of cards. But Joshua, he was, didn't the Lord say, be strong and courageous? How many times in chapter 1 did we look at that? Be strong and very courageous. Well, here's an opportunity, Joshua, for you to obey the Lord now. Be strong and courageous. Look at this enemy in front of you, or a perceived enemy. And Joshua did not run. He shouted out to him, are you for us or are you against us? In other words, if he had said, I'm against you, Joshua would have taken his sword and he would have taken this man on. Without a doubt, he did not run. He engaged the enemy. And he is to be commended. He's very courageous. He's a brave man. That's all I can say. And the answer he received in verse 14 was what is known as a wonderful divine revelation that would encourage his heart and strengthen his faith in the Lord for the battle and the battles that lie ahead. Look at verse 14. Here's the answer. The Lord actually didn't say, really. He didn't answer Joshua's question. Are you for me? Or are you against me? He just said, No. Now, what does that mean? It's like a political answer, isn't it? Nay, verse 14. Are you for me? No. Are you against me? No. It seems a strange answer, but then the Lord goes on to explain. He didn't need to go in. He explained who he was. And once he mentioned who he was, it was clear 
Joshua's question was answered. Nay, and I'll paraphrase. Nay, no. I am not against you, Joshua. But as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? I have come to help you. I've come to be on your side. I am the commander now. In other words, Joshua, you're the leader. I've appointed you. But I'm now stepping you aside. I'm now taking over. The battle will be the Lord's. And I have come to show you now the battle plan for Jericho. You will not need to fight. I will fight for you. That's what the Lord was saying here. I'm here to help you in the battle as the Lord of hosts. In other words, the Lord of hosts, the captain of the hosts of the Lord is really the name Jehovah Shabbaoth. Not Sabbath, but Jehovah Shabbaoth, the Lord of the hosts of heaven. I want to tell you that this captain of the hosts of the Lord or the Lord of hosts is never used. It's a compound name for your God and mine. It's a compound name for the God of Israel. And it's used only. Now listen to this. And I challenge you to search your Bible, your English Bible, and get out your Hebrew lexicon or whatever you use and check this out. You will not find any reference to the title or the compound name Lord of Hosts except it is only used when God's people are at their weakest. The Lord only uses this name. He uses the name Adonai. He uses the name El Shaddai. He uses the name Elohim, Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God of Israel. He only uses this name. He only identifies himself under this name when his people are being attacked by the enemy, when his people are vulnerable, when his people are weak, when his people are insufficient. The Lord uses this name. He identifies himself under this name, and this name is victory. This name is a name that cannot be defeated. I am with you as the Lord of the hosts of the armies of heaven. The person Joshua met that day was the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of the hosts of the Lord. It is what is known as a Christophany. That's a big word, believe me. It's a, it's a word that means it's an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, we talk about Christ came in human form and the virgin birth in Bethlehem. Coming to Christmas, we uh, will remember the birth of Christ. And people will say that this is the, the first time Christ appeared on earth in human form. It's not. It's not. There, there were many appearances of Christ in human form, and this is one of them. I think the first one is in Genesis 17, when Christ came. It's what is known as a Christophany. In other words, it is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ before he came by virgin birth into this world. And there were many others. Gideon had one as well. And we do believe that Moses and many others had an appearance of Christ. It's in other words, Christ, before he came into this world by virgin birth to die for our sins, he appeared to individuals in human form. And these encounters and this encounter would inspire and strengthen and encourage Joshua and the people for the forthcoming battle. And I believe that he would have been receiving inspiration, complete knowledge of victory, because Jehovah Sabaoth, the captain of the hosts and the armies of heaven, was with him. And you know, there are certain truths associated with this encounter at Gilgal that we need to look at today to encourage us as we face our enemies, as we face our problems, as we look at our fears, as we look at our foes, as we think of the world, the flesh and the devil, and that triune uh, company of the enemy of the child of God, I want you to think, first of all, as we look at these truths in this encounter, that there is an unseen army on the side of every believer. Now, you need to understand this. There is an unseen army on the side of every single believer. An invincible host is with us today. It is behind us. It is in front of us. And it is all around us. And the Bible does give us 
a glimpse of that in 2 Kings chapter 6. And I want you to take your Bible right now and please turn with me and turn over just a few pages to 2 Kings chapter 6. You take your Bible now, young person, older person, you take your Bible and open it up at 2 Kings chapter 6. And I want you to see this. I want you to see this. 2 Kings chapter 6. And look at the verse 15. And you know it's the, 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 the record of Elisha, Elisha, sorry, and his servant whenever they uh, were in the city. And his servant rose early in the morning. Look what it says in verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city with both horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And Elisha, he could see something different. He didn't see the Assyrian army. He didn't see the city surrounded with the chariots of iron. He saw on the hilltop and in the sky angels of God and chariots of fire. And you notice with me what it says in verse 16. And he, that's Elisha, answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now, if you could only see it today, I want to tell you, if you could see it now, that around this building, around this actual building, in this very house, there is a merit of angels and Christ, the captain of our salvation. He's not just a meek and gentle lamb that some are preaching about Christ today and you're to love everybody and God loves us all and, and you've got to be meek and gentle like Christ. Christ is a man of war. If you wanted to see a picture of Christ and they paint pictures of Christ, they paint a picture of Christ and it's always in his weakest form. Do you ever see that? The Roman Catholic Church have Christ always in his weakest form. He's either a little babe dependent on Mary or else he's crucified on a cross in his weakest form. But the Bible never paints Christ in his weakest form. He is the Lord of glory. He's King of kings. There's not an artist that ever lived or will ever live, that ever could paint a picture like the Bible does on the canvas of Holy Scripture. And if you wanted a picture of Christ now, oh, I know we saw the model of our high priest. And that's what Christ is. He is all these things. But I want to tell you now, here now in this building, Christ is here. And he is clothed with armor. And he has his sword drawn. And with him are myriads of angels, the hosts, the armies of heaven. Innumerable company of angels are now surrounding this building. And if God opened your eyes now and mine, you would see them. And that hill there, the graveyard is, will be filled with chariots of fire. The very carriageway would be bunged. I mean that. I don't know how far, right across to Ards and right across maybe to Money Ray or Kalinchi for all I know. And they're here. And when you leave this building and you go home and we go our separate ways, they follow you. I'm telling you, that's the teaching of Holy Scripture. And they're here right now. And then you see puny flesh. This little grasshopper of a rebellious sinner. Mocking your Christ and mocking your belief and mocking your faith and laughing at your testimony. And if you could have an eye to see that he's standing before the hosts of heaven and Christ, the captain of our salvation, you would feel sorry for that person. You wouldn't run away, catch a grip. You wouldn't run away. You couldn't. Even if you were the biggest card in the world, most cards hide behind the bigger fella. <laughs> That's what they do. So even if you felt you were a coward and ashamed of it as a Christian, you couldn't run away. 
You would need to stand your ground. You know why? There are more with us than with them. Now multiply the single individual to the hundred or the thousand or even the five thousand or ten thousand. You take the the minority of the sodomite pro-abortion community in this nation of ours. Look at them. The humanist and the atheist. And think of the Crown Prosecution Service. That's right. Those that legislate what is criminal and and what's not. And their statements. I don't think a Christian very soon will have any, any justice in court. You can't. The Crown Prosecution Service have said that there are portions of the Old Testament, listen to it, that are inappropriate today. So they will criminalize those portions of Scripture. Now, are we going to be running away from that? Not at all. Who are they to defy the armies of God? One of the greatest examples of what we've just said there is David and Goliath. If you ever read the story of David and Goliath, look for these things. One, first of all, look at the Israelites. The Bible says when Goliath came out and he roared and defied the God of Israel, you know what it says? That the Israelites fled. Then comes this stripling of a youth as he was described in Scripture. This little boy. And where's he? David. The Bible says when the Israelites fled, David went and drew near to the giant. And the giant drew near to him. And you'll find these words in Scripture. In 2 Samuel, you'll find these words. And David, it was said of David that whenever Goliath roared, he actually said these words, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the God of Israel? I'll fight with him. He threw off the armor, took five stones from the brook, and then the Bible says when the Philistine stood that day and roared against Israel and defied and blasphemed the God of Israel, David ran toward him. He wasn't afraid. He had the army of God with him. He didn't need the Israelites. I want to tell you something. There is an unseen army with you. And see when the ungodly get around you and the ungodly surround you, and they mock you, they laugh. Or even if they're subtle and they want to draw you toward them, they want you to do what they're doing. They want you in their company. I want to tell you something. You can resist them. You have an army. You have a captain. One who will fight for you. And on this occasion, Joshua didn't need to fight. The walls came down flat. And we look at that in chapter 6. The Lord did something remarkable that day. And the enemy just fell in front of Joshua. They had very little to do. The battle was the Lord's. I want to tell you now, we we have an army that cannot be defeated. Would you not like to be on the side of an army that cannot be defeated? Who would we say will win the war? Uh, The Russians or the Ukrainians? Who will win the war? The American or the Chinese? Who will win the war? Israel or the Arab? Who will win the war? NATO or the Arab alliance? Who will win the war? No matter what it is, The Muslim, Iraq, Iran, who will win those wars? We're never sure. And some say, well, America wouldn't be defeated. How do you know? Well, Britain will not. How do you know? Well, you've got France there as well and some of the top five fighting nations in the world and the armor they have and the firepower they have and those who study war look at their planes. They look at what they have and they say, we can't be defeated and the nuclear weapons now as well that could literally destroy the earth, but they'll not. But I want to tell you something. There's no army that cannot be defeated on earth. No army. Greater nations than America and Britain and Russia and China have all been defeated. Greater kingdoms have come and gone. The Persian kingdom and the Roman Empire, all gone. Alexander the Great conquered the the entire earth, sat down depressed and said, I've no more to conquer. Even he was defeated. Napoleon, all defeated. They go through the list of individuals in history. But I want to tell you of an army that has never lost a battle. An army that has never lost a fight. An army that remains strong to this day. And I'll tell you who it is. And it's captained by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the armies of heaven. It's wonderful that you are enlisted. You're enlisted in that army. Okay, you're a different regiment. But you're still underneath that same army. Angels, Christ, God himself. The believer, clad in the armor of God. 
battling against the world, the flesh, and the devil. I want to tell you this, and this is not arrogance. Far from it. This is humility of heart. We're on the winning side. The battle's already won. The victory's already been completed. We just enter into it by faith. We sung it. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So we're not on our own. Don't think you're on your own. Don't think, well, there's nobody with me. Not even the Lord. You're wrong. If you had eyes to see, the eye of faith would see. Right now, chariots of fire, angels, holy angels, pure holy angels, cannot countenance sin, agents of the justice and judgment of God upon earth. Think of it. And the defying sinner, he's a grasshopper. He's nothing. You know what it's like? I've often, and this is a poor illustration, I've often thought of, of a little child, a little child of three years of age, and it's probably the skinniest child you'll ever see. And the bones are protruding through its very rib cage and flesh. And there it is, a little girl, three years of age, nothing but skin and bone. And there you have, I'm going to say Mike Tyson, but maybe your man Fury, who won last night apparently. I just forget his name now. What do you call him, Tim? Tyson, so it is. <laughs> Tyson Fury, thank you. And imagine Tyson Fury standing before a three-year-old child and the three-year-old girl with a fist saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punch you. <laughs> I'm going to take you on. I'm going to destroy you. The child wouldn't even do anything, couldn't do anything. Well, there you are, the godless sinner. That's right. The anti-Christ movement. All of them. Pro-abortionists, sodomites, you name it. Humanists, all of them. And they can do nothing. That's how I believe the illustration looks. That's how weak they are in the face of our God. And it's even a poor illustration. I couldn't even think really of one that would really get the, the truth across properly. But that's how I believe absurd it would be for the ungodly to try to take on the church of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something. Every kingdom is gone, but the kingdom of God is still here. It has. And every Abel will be attacked by Cain. And it's true. And every Moses will be opposed by the sons of Korah. I want to tell you Christ will build his church. That's our motto text. And the gates of hell shall prevail against it. Did I say that? Does the Bible say that? No. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Child of God, you have victory. I don't care where you are today, what you're facing, what problems you have. In the name of Jesus, do you believe it? Do you believe this? In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. We have triumph. He causes us to triumph. And if God be for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. God causes us to triumph. That is, that's what is known as the victory parade after war. The war hasn't even been finished yet. And yet the Lord's causing us to take the wreath, to put it on our heads as victors. Can you imagine a football team coming out? And saying, England, and saying, no matter what you say, whoever's in the world, we're going to win the World Cup. And that's it. Nobody's going to defeat us. And you might as well give us the cup now. We'll put it in the trophy room now. And said, instead of gathering it, we'll not even have a victory parade. We'll have it now in London. Before we've even played in the quarterfinal. In fact, they're not even there yet. Before we get to the semis or the final, we'll have the victory parade in London. And we'll have all the paratechnics and all the flags and we'll have millions out in the streets celebrating our victory and then we'll go and win the World Cup what team would ever do that but I'll tell you the Christian army can oh why? every day we can have a triumph that's what it means to cause us to triumph it means to have the victory parade before the battles even fought or won such is the certainty that the Lord cannot be defeated and neither can the church or the Christian I tell you we're on the winning side it's the side I want to be on, the winning side. Young people pick a team. They never pick a team. Do you ever notice this? They never pick a team when they're children. That's at the bottom of the league. That's a fact. They never pick a team. And if they do, then they're probably supporting some team that's in the fourth division. They always pick a team that's on top of the league. Young people, you ask them, well, what team do you support? I've never heard a young person say to me, I support Gillingham. Oh, right. Very good. Liverpool, Chelsea, and of course the greatest team in the world. Tottenham Hotspurs, isn't that right, Matthew? The greatest team in the world. I picked that when I was a young fella, and they were way down near the bottom of the league. So I can't be called a fair weather supporter. 
But I want to tell you, you always want to be on the winning side. And you are on the winning side. There's an unseen army with every believer. Very quickly, Joshua was not afraid to challenge and engage what he perceived as an enemy. Do you notice this encounter? He wasn't afraid to challenge and engage what he perceived was an enemy. Look at verse 13. He says, are you for us? Are you one of our adversaries? Are you with us or against us? Who are you? You see why he wasn't afraid? He wasn't a coward. Remember, Joshua was close to Jericho. And suddenly this man appears with a sword drawn, ready to fight against God's servant. But he didn't run away. He didn't shout for backup. He didn't shout, Caleb, Caleb. He didn't shout perhaps for maybe Abraham or Isaac, maybe some of those Hebrew names that were over his men. Not about the original Isaacs and Abrahams, by the way, but their namesakes. But I want to tell you, he didn't shout, help, help, that someone came flying out of the camp. No. You notice what he did here? He engaged the enemy on his own. The apostle Paul said this to the church at Philippi. Have you ever studied in Philippi? It's a little, I know, side thought. Ever studied in Philippi the word nothing? You can entitle a message, and I may do that sometime. And it's called nothing in Philippians. Nothing in Philippians. And four times the word nothing is used. And one of those times is here in chapter 128. And here's what it says. Paul said to the church at Philippi, In nothing terrified of your adversaries. In nothing not one single issue, not one single opposition are you to be put in fear of your enemy. And no matter what the enemy legislate or say or threaten, no matter what they come against you with, you're not to be terrified by your enemies. They're the enemies of Christ. They're the enemies of Christ. And you're not to run away from them. You're to engage them. And even if it's a perceived enemy, even if you're not sure where this person's coming from and you might feel they're not thoroughly orthodox, you should challenge them. Antichrist is already working. The Jehovah Witness, the Mormons, the Roman Catholic system is Antichrist. Stand over that to the day that I meet the true Christ. Antichrist against Christ. And they are against Christ. All for Mary and saints and prayers and masses and Christ does not come in but just to give it a veneer. I want to tell you the way to victory is to face our troubles, our enemies, to face our fears, to face our problems, knowing this, knowing this, that the Lord is bigger than them all and he can sort them out in an instant if he so chose to do so. I believe we shouldn't be afraid to face the enemy, challenge sin. Don't be afraid to challenge. Check it in your own life first. Challenge it in society. You're the salt of the earth. You're to preserve righteousness. You're the light of the world. Expose darkness. And you're to have nothing, child of God. Nothing. There's another word for nothing in Ephesians. You're to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now the Lord is on my side. Whom? Shall I fear? Can I say it thirdly and very quickly? Prayer is always central to all we do for the Lord. Joshua is about to take on a city. He's about to lead his army into war. And Joshua got alone with God. And he brought the people to the Lord. He brought the Israelites to God. And he sought a way whereby he would overcome Jericho. He wasn't shying away from fighting. He wasn't shying away from doing battle with the enemy. But he wanted to know the mind of God, the will of God. It's always a good thing. And I'm sure you, like myself, have learned by experience that we need to acknowledge the Lord in all our ways. And he'll direct our paths. There's so many paths that we could take. There's the way that I would go. It's the wrong way. And there's the way that I should go. And it's the right way. Now, how do I know? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lead not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge the Lord, and he shall direct, he shall direct, plural, thy paths, thy many ways. There's so many ways you could go, and you would not have, and I don't mean to put you down, I'll talk about myself then, 
There are so many ways I could go, and I would not have the wisdom to know which is the right way. That's why I need to read the Word. I need to spend time with God. I need to bring the matter to the Lord. I need to pray over that matter. I need to pray it out of my soul. I need to cast my care on Him. I need to ask the Lord for a right way. I need to pray the Lord will guide me, direct me, that the Lord would counsel me, that the Lord would instruct me, and He would show me the way through the wilderness and through the maze of different routes. I want to think here of Joshua in the place of prayer bringing matters to the Lord. Before we engage the enemy, uh, we need, as I said to you, these events at Gilgal. We need to crucify the flesh, the old nature. We need to look to Christ and what he has done for us and not forget and to love him and to serve him and to fight for him. And then we need to meet with him and we need to be encouraged by him and bring everything to him. There's one final thought, and it's this, at this event, the third event at Gilgal, and it's this. There is a need for humility and for holiness if we are to have victory in service. Look at verses 15, 14 and 15. Look what it says there. Verses 14 and 15. It says, and, and he said, Nay, but as captain as the host of the Lord, am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. That's how we know it was God, it was Christ. He worshipped. An angel would have lifted him up and said, Don't worship me, I'm only an angel. Mere man would have said the same as Paul and, and others did when they bowed before them. And Peter, they says, No, get up, we're only mere men. Uh, but this heavenly visitor did not refuse worship. That's why it's a Christophany a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And he says, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thy stand is is holy. And Joshua did so. And the moment he did that, the Lord communicated his mind as to the plan to take Jericho, which we'll see, God willing, in chapter 6. In other words, it would have been easy for to say, Joshua, say, the Lord's on my side. Well, he's parted the Jordan River for us. He's put fear on our enemies. So we'll just do as we like because he's promised us the land anyway. He didn't. He met with God. And the Lord said to him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? Here's what the Lord said. He says, put off thy shoe, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Well, what is meant by that? Why did the Lord not say, here's what I want you to do? When you stand on your feet, when you get back to your men and rouse them up, and I'll go before you and we'll take Jericho together. He didn't. This was vitally important. These are lessons before he ever gauged the enemy that he was learning and passing on to the people. I want to tell you something. He fell on his face. There's humility. His face was in the dirt and the dust of Canaan. That's what it was. His face was in the dirt and the dust. He recognized that's where he came from. That's all he was before God. There's no room for pride in the service of God. I want to tell you, pride destroys the work. Pride actually hinders the work. Pride chases away the holy dove, the spirit of God. There is no room for pride in the work of God. And James tells us, God resisteth the proud. God stands against the proud. And if Joshua hadn't fallen to his face, if Joshua hadn't acknowledged him as, wor as Lord and worshipped him and then submitted to his command, there was no victory. Joshua learned something that day was this, that I and myself am not worthy of a victory over Jericho. And he fell in his face to the ground. And there's humility. That's what is needed in the work of God. God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. And furthermore, the command to take off thy shoe or shoes, that he was on holy ground, was a reference to the dirt and to the dust that sandals or shoes gathered from the earth. It's what is known as what defiles the feet, what defiles the walk, what hinders the believer, the dirt and the defilement of this earth and this world around us. And this reference, take off your shoes, is to remove defilement and dirt from your life. If you are to have victory with me, you cannot march on Jericho with the captain of the Lord's host and with holy angels. And we saw that and we will see it when there was sin in the camp when they stole and coveted from the city of Jericho the accursed thing. Sin. The accursed thing. 
symbolically and spiritually. It refers to the removing of defilement in a believer's life in order that we might come into the presence of the Lord, that we might be washed and made clean and filled with the Holy Ghost, that we might live the Christian life and battle against the world, the flesh and the devil. Humility and holiness. And we heard what holiness was in the series of meetings. Holiness is simply Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. If you were to do good works to people and help people, that's what is known as holiness. If you were to love someone who said things bad about you and prayed for them, that's holiness. If you were to kind to some enemy, that's holiness. At Christmas time, if you were to relieve the poor, that's holiness. Well, it can come under Christian charity, we know that. But that's Christ's likeness. That's a holy life. It's a life that's lived to the glory of God and the good of our fellow man. That's what holiness is. It's Christ's likeness to be like Jesus. Humility and Christ's likeness, we could say, are two of those mighty weapons that through God they pull down strongholds. May we strive for these Christian graces and virtues in our lives. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we do thank thee for today for a sense of the divine presence. We thank thee for thy word to our hearts. We've come to these chapters and in many ways, Lord, it has to be said that they are the white pages of our Bible. They're pages that we don't naturally turn to. Very rarely would we say in conversation, uh, I remember reading in Joshua 5, where these are pages that sadly are untrodden by many Christians. These are pages, O God, that remain white in our Bible. There's a little very few wrinkling of this page. Uh, Lord, there's no creases in this page in most Bibles. I realize, Lord, it's ground that has never really been, Lord, entered into. But we thank thee for leading us to these pages. And, Lord, such choice truths and gems we find. How often we've seen in the natural world when they go down into the depths of the ocean or into the jungles that have never been, Lord, inhabited, and they find creatures, and they find vegetable and, Lord, animal life that has never been seen before, and they have to rename it and add it onto the list of those things that exist in the earth. And, Lord, we come to pages like this, and we find such gems of truth, and we're glad that you've been guiding us and feeding us and helping us And we pray, Lord, we will be doers of the word and we'll be thankful for all the pages of our Bible and make sure that we will not only just thumb through them, but read them, study them, and apply them into our hearts and lives. So bless us now today as we leave the house that we do so prayerfully and very carefully, pondering the things we have heard. And Father, remember us this afternoon and this evening. Bless John and Gemma especially. We thank thee, Lord, for thy good hand upon them. It's not only a testimonial night tonight, but it's an occasion as a church that we can gather and give thanks to God for wonderful answers to prayer. Be with us now. In Jesus' precious name, amen.